Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, it is a pleasure to have all of you here. Apologize for the little bit of a late start, but a computer problem. In any event, it's fixed, I think. Uh, and um, uh, I welcome you all to this um, FERG session with um, Hubert Jolie, um, who is here and uh, a really remarkable man who's just about to publish a book called The Heart of Business. Uh, he is he is uh, one of the most extraordinary human beings I've met, uh, and he he will tell you more about what he's been doing. I met him because of the fact that he's been a long time treasured member of the board of directors, of the Ralph Lauren Corporation, uh, where he is, um, I think, soon to be the lead director. It may already be, but not yet. Um, but in any event, he was the CEO of Best Buy, the huge uh, 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 retail stores all over the country. Uh, and he took it over when it was in very difficult circumstances. He'll tell you more about what he did, but he took it from the point in which it was on the point of failing to the point where it's a huge success. I mean, the, the stock price gives some indication of it. When he took it over, I think the stock price was $11 a share. When he left it, it was $111 a share, um, which tells you something about the extent to which the market thinks what he did was a great job. Um, his book on uh, the heart of business, which is not will be made, been published in May, is a book about his sense of how businesses should conduct themselves. Um, and it's, uh, it's a book that is, I've read all the way through. It's a fabulous book which talks about, and he's gonna explain more about that himself. But in any event, welcome you all, um, and welcome Hubert Jolie to this visit, virtual visit to the Duke campus. We will make up with this with a real visit to the Duke campus where we can offer you some wine and some food and the, 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 the in-person presence of a really remarkable group of people. So Hubert, the floor is yours. Well, Joel, thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. I, I know you know that Joel is just a treasure on the planet. I've had the privilege of uh, knowing Joel for 12 years on the Ralph Lauren Board, as Joel just indicated. Can we all agree that uh, Joel is by far, maybe rest of you accepted, but as far as I'm concerned, the nicest person that you ever get to meet. It's a joy to work with, and it's been a light in my life. It's a privilege to spend an hour and a half with, with you this afternoon. What Joel and I discuss is that, uh, I'm gonna speak for maybe 20, 25 minutes. We'll, we'll see, it's not very precise. Uh, and then really look forward to having a dialogue with you on some important issues. And the basic thesis I'm gonna uh, talk about, which of course is at the core of the book, is that um, contrary to what Milton Friedman wanted us to believe, Right, it's important for business to be a force for good in the world. And my conviction with many years in business, you, you can see some scars and a lot of gray air, is that uh, business can do well by doing good. It's by doing good that we can do well. And that business can be more than for profit, has to be more than for profit. And that today, you know, we, we have an urgent need for a refoundation of business and capitalism around some key principles. And you, can you hear the siren in New York? <laughs> I'm in New York City. If it's too bothersome, I'll close the window, but it's a... So yes, we did this refoundation of business and capitalism around some important principles around purpose and humanity, putting purpose as the North Star of business and people as the, uh, as the center. And if we do this, this can lead to a more sustainable future a healthier world. And of course, we know what the definition of madness is, right? Trying the same thing and hoping for a different outcome. We know that whatever we've been doing for the last 20 years, I would assert, I don't know whether you would agree with me, but it ain't working, right? There's, uh, the problems we have today are not being solved by the current approach. So we need a different approach. And the good news, I think, from my point of view is that business can be a key contributor to solving some of the world's most pressing uh, problems. Now, in my case, this is, even though I'm now a professor at Harvard Business School, which would uh, 
you know, uh, gives me great pleasure to be in the company of members of the Duke, uh, you know, community here. A lot of what I've learned has been, of course, from studying great thinkers, observing great leaders, but also 30 years of uh, practice in business. And what I want to do is tell you the story of Best Buy since 2012 and how applying these principles has been essential to the resurgence uh, of, uh, of Best Buy. And the philosophy that's laid out in the book is really the philosophy that's behind this resurgence, but of course has much broader application. So here is the story. Once upon a time in 2012, everybody, as, as Joel said, everybody thought Best Buy was going to die. You could ask anybody. The market cap of Best Buy, I think, was two times EBITDA, which you know is a good sign that you're going to die. And all of the analysts, all of the investors, you know, were extremely positive. I don't think there was a single buy on the stock that tells you <laughs> it was unanimous. It was a series of challenges. We have strategic challenges. Amazon was going to kill us. Uh, also, the fact that the key vendors like Apple and Microsoft and Sony were building their own stores was a potentially lethal threat. There was operational challenges with the quality of service. You may have visited Best Buy at the time. Frankly, my observation was that the quality of service had really gone down significantly. You had leadership challenges with my predecessor having been fired. Uh, and you had shareholder challenges with the share price really going low. And the founder, wonderful Dick Schultz, was trying to take the company private. So this was the all-you-can-eat menu of challenges. The reason why I took the job is it's not that I was either crazy or suicidal, like some of my friends thought at the time. But I had concluded, based on the outside in due diligence I had done this, that uh, the world actually needed Best Buy. As customers, for some of our technology purchases, we do need to see, touch, and feel the product. We do need to be able to ask questions, or we may need the immediacy of grab and go. So the customers needed Best Buy, and then the vendors needed Best Buy. Because if you're spending billions of dollars of R&D, you need a, sh a, sh a place where to showcase the fruit of the, uh, this R&D investment. Because the, 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 you know, if you're buying a TV, picture quality is really important. The only place in the world where you can see the quality of the picture of a TV is in a store. Same with speakers or headphones. And so uh, a world was just Amazon and, and Walmart would not have been uh, a good world for, for these, uh, these tech companies. And so the other thing I saw was that uh, most of the problems that the company had were self-inflicted, right? And so if they were self-inflicted, they were operational in nature, then you can fix them. And so that convinced me to, to take the job. And uh, I'm glad I did. What did we do? I want to briefly describe what we did, but I want to then insist on the how we did it. And I want to do this in two phases because I think there was two distinct phases. Phase one, uh, from 2012 to 2016 would be you know, the turnaround, so saving the company. In phase two, from 2016 to now, is, which we called building the new blue, the first phase was renew blue, the second phase is building the new blue, per the color of the blue shirts of the sales associates on the floor, was creating, a, you know, deciding what the company should look like when it would grow up, and then building that, uh, that next generation. The turnarounds, you know, the what actually was pretty straightforward. We did a handful of things. We made sure our prices were competitive. We gave the uh, blue shirts the authority to match Amazon's prices. That way, we took a price of the table as a consideration for customers. We invested in the online shopping experience because that's where most of us, you know, most of the time start our shopping journey. And there was work to do, right? Uh, I, I spent my first week on the job in working in stores to listen to the frontliners. And the first thing they told me was, uh, the, the search engine on the site is not working. I said, what do you mean? Well, type Cinderella and you'll get Nikon cameras. I know it rhymes, but it's not quite the same, right? So, so we changed the search engine on the site. We worked on the supply chain, right, to make sure we would ship as fast as Amazon. We invested in the shopping experience in the stores. We invested in the associates. We partnered with the world's foremost tech companies. So we told companies like Samsung was the first one, instead of you building your own stores, why don't you have a store within our store? We'll, we'll run it for you. It's not only really your store, but you'll have a section of our store where you can showcase your products. 
And so the customers will be able to see the Apple products on one side of the aisle, the Samsung products on the other side of the aisle, and talk to the associates and, and see what's best. And of course, that was a game changer because it was good for the customer, good for the vendors, and good for us because this was part of what I call my OPM strategy or other people's money strategy, which is it's my money, it was just in the wrong banking account strategy. So we got paid for doing this. And, and we ended up doing this with all of the foremost tech companies, including Amazon and Google and Facebook and Sony and uh, Canon, Nikon and, and, and so forth. And then we took some cost out, about $2 billion. Uh, but note that we, uh, so the, the, the principal remedy that people had suggested that we employ was cut, cut, cut close stores, cut headcounts. Does that sound familiar in a restructuring, right? You announce that and then the company share price goes up. We did the opposite. We said, we're first gonna grow revenue with a lot of the things I've mentioned. And if we're gonna take cost out, which we had to, we're gonna first focus on non-salary expenses, which is all of the elements of the cost structure that have nothing to do with people. So an example of this is, so we sell a lot of TVs at Best Buy they're big and they're thin, so they break. And at the time we would break about $200 million worth of TVs every year, if you can imagine that. Now, if you can reduce this by 50%, that's a $100 million saving. And you can do this by working with the vendors on the design of the TVs, the packaging, and then how the TVs get, uh, get handled. And in my book, you only cut headcount as a last resort, if, if you don't have any other choice. But even then, You'll try to redeploy the you eliminate positions, but you try to redeploy people into a new opportunities based on turnover and so forth. So that's the what. But the more important lesson from this turnaround phase is the how, right? It's the opposite of the cut, cut, cut. It's all focused on people. So it's people first. First, start with listening to people on the front line, which I did by spending a full week working in stores initially, and then rebuilding the team at the top. It's people last because you cut headcount as a last resort. And then it's all about creating energy, right? If you see a company as a human organization made of individuals working together in pursuit of a goal, this, there's the humanity of the organization. And I know in physics, energy is a finite quantity, right? You get, I think it was uh, Lavoisier, my compatriot, I am French, said uh, you cannot create anything, right? It gets transformed. Uh, but energy in a human organization can be created. And so how you create energy is by listening to people, co-creating the plan, and then bringing everybody forward by celebrating progress, being open about difficulties and working together to address these difficulties. So this first phase was very intense, but it was quite joyful. Uh, Joel calls me, Ms. not Mr. Jolie, but Ms. Mr. Joy. That's where it's coming from. It was a very joyful, because we were saving the company and it was a very human uh, enterprise. There was some hiccups along the way. Maybe we can talk about this later. Life is not linear, we all know this, but that was the first phase. The second phase was a bit more strategic because the first phase was really about fixing things. One day uh, at a board meeting, we decided that the turnaround was over and that we had to enter into this new phase of building the new bloom and really trying to imagine what the company should look like so that we could accelerate our growth. So we did strategy work. We, we did a lot of uh, consumer research, segmentation. I'm a professor of marketing at HBS. So we did all of this, right? Uh, segmentation, targeting, positioning. We targeted the customers who like technology but need help with it. And our positioning was to be you know, helpful to them. Um, to be a good resource for them and to be helpful to these, um, to these customers. But then there was a turning point, which is when we decided to define our purpose as organization. Why do we exist? The French call this the raison d'être. In French, it says raison d'être. Uh, and we decided that we were actually not a retailer, certainly not a brick and mortar retailer, but not a retailer, period. We were a company that was in the business of enriching lives through technology by addressing key human needs, such as entertainment, communication, productivity, right? Work from home, learn from home, wellness, health. And that was our business. So in many ways we were in the happiness business, in a very human business of happiness. 
doing this had two benefits. One, it was quite inspiring for people working at the company, but also it expanded the addressable market. Because instead of just being focused on selling hardware, we could address needs. So let me give you an example. With the aging of the population in the US and around the world, there's a need which is to help aging seniors live in their home longer independently and still be safe. So we have a service where we put sensors under the bed, in the sofa, in the bathroom, in the bedroom, fall detection. And with remote monitoring and artificial intelligence in our great care centers, we can detect if something is going wrong and then trigger an intervention. That's a very useful service. I guess many of us have aging parents. We know what it is to have uh, frail seniors. And so it's a growth opportunity that is not sold through the stores, it's sold through insurance company, but it leverages our capabilities and allows us to grow. Similarly, one other example is we have this service, which I hope every one of you will decide to take advantage of, which is the in-home advisor program. If, you're, if, if your need is too complex to be addressed online or in the store, like you're redoing your entire family room or your kitchen or your patio, it's better if we come to you. So we'll have these highly qualified in-home designers, in-home advisors, they'll come to your house or your place and on site they'll have a conversation. They'll try to define with you what you're trying to accomplish, design a proposal and then make it happen. And then over time become like your, the CIO or CTO for your home, which is something we need with, given the, the increased number of electronic devices we have in our homes. So we're moving from a business based on setting products through transactions to, to a business that's selling solutions and building relationships with customers. Now on paper, this sounds great, but then you know, how do you make this happen? We had difficulties. One was one of capacity. So I was expecting, we've, we had defined the strategy, I was expecting the entire organization to embrace it and make it happen. Uh, of course, nothing changed because running business is a 44 billion, now it's $47 billion business, 125,000 people. It takes a lot of time and energy and attention to run the business. And I was naively expecting the organization to both run the business and transform the business. So what we did is we set up an organization on the side called the Strategic Growth Office with people dedicated to the reinvention of the business. We also had an understanding problem. So the blue shirts would say, or many people in the organization, so enriching lives through technology by addressing key human, that's a mouthful, right? Somebody in corporate must have come up with that. Uh, so how do you write yourself into this story? How do you have 125,000 people write themselves into that story? So we set up a task force with 40 or 60 people, some of the most highly respected individuals, leaders um, at the company who had been there for a long while. And they tried, to, they, they worked on making it real for everybody at the company. And they boiled it down to saying, what we're trying to do is we're trying to be an inspiring friends to, our, to each other and to our customers, which translated into training in stores where, so we closed the stores down for a few hours and we had this training that attended of course, where uh, we asked, so it's not PowerPoint presentation, right? We asked two questions. One, share with each other your life story. So I was spared with a young woman. She had been uh, in an abusive relationship with an ex-boyfriend. She'd been homeless and Best Buy was really our home and our family. All of a sudden I see her not as an employee, but as a human being. And then the second part was think about an inspiring friend in your life. Hopefully all of us have one. For me, I know it's my, uh, other than Joel, it's my older brother, Philip, he's just wonderful. And so uh, we exchanged these stories. And then the conclusion was essentially what we're trying to do, we're trying to be human beings interacting with other human beings. And we're trying to be an inspiring friend for customers. And so when somebody comes into the store, asking for help, treat them not as a walking wallet, but as a, uh, as a human being uh, and, and uh, try to sell them as if they were your mother or your best friend. Let me give you an example to illustrate this. One day there was a mom who went into one of, her, of our stores. She was with her child and her child had gotten as a gift, 
a dinosaur tour, toy, a dinosaur toy for holidays. And that dinosaur toy, unfortunately, was broken. So the dinosaur was sick. Now, in a normal story, you would have got, you know, you would have been sent to the toy aisle, and maybe there was still a dinosaur toy still available for sale, and you would have had a uh, replacement. But there was two associates in the store uh, that took care of that uh, mother and her young child. And uh, they did something different. They went behind a counter and they took the dinosaur toy and they performed a surgical procedure on the dinosaur. And for those of us watching Good Doctor on Amazon, they walked the little child through the steps of the surgical procedure. Of course, at the last minute, substituted the uh, a new toy and gave a cure dinosaur back to the child and his mother. Imagine the joy of the child and the mother. Now, here's the question. Do you think there was a standard operating procedure at Best Buy on how to deal with sick dinosaurs? Crawford is saying no. Crawford, do you think there was a memo from me on how to deal with these situations? Crawford is saying absolutely not. It was in the heart of these two associates. And when I saw that, I said, this is human magic. And the, the future of the company and my role as a leader is to create an environment where we can unleash human magic at scale. And I learned so much from that. That may be the most important learning, which was that, uh, of course, we had to have our noble purpose, but it was putting people at the center and creating an environment where each one of the 125,000 employees could blossom and uh, be supercharged in, in pursuit of that uh, purpose. There's five ingredients I have discovered to make this happen. And by the way, it's not about communication, communicating a plan, telling people what to do, putting incentives in place to make it happen. That's the old, this is 20th century and that doesn't work. Ingredient number one, create an environment where every one of the associates can connect what drives them, their individual purpose with the purpose of the company. So here is a story that was a, there's a store general manager in the Boston market. He would ask every one of the associates, so hundred of them in the store, in this store, tell me about your dream. What is your dream in life? At Best Buy or outside of Best Buy? Write it down in the break room. And my job now is to help you achieve this dream. There was another moment, I think in 2016, where as an executive team, we would you know, go offsite every quarter to work on our strategy and our progress. And one time over dinner, this is when, remember when we used to have face-to-face -face dinners a long time ago? That was one of those. And uh, we spent the entire evening sharing with each other our life story and our purpose in life. You rarely do this. I don't know about the university environments, but in a corporate environment, you rarely ask these questions. And yet this was transformative because we discover that 80% of us, we wanted to do some good in the world and that we could use Best Buy as a platform uh, to do some, some good things in the world. And we got to know each other at a much more profound level. It changed our team forever. The second ingredient is create an environment where there's genuine, authentic human connections that take place. So here's another story. Uh, an associate in one of our stores once told me that his life changed the day a manager recognized him and took an interest in him. He was blown away. So my compatriot, Rene Descartes of the Cartesian philosophy that all of you are familiar with, said a long time ago, I think, therefore I am. Eh, I think he's wrong. It's I am seen. Therefore, I am. If every one of the associates of the company can feel they are seen, that they exist, that they can be themselves, they can be who they are, it changes everything. And that's where diversity and inclusion comes into play. It starts with each individual. And then, of course, it expands to systemic issues, such as you know, issues around gender diversity or the lack thereof and systemic racism, which is a disease that uh, corporations need to address 
because it makes good business sense, because if your team does not represent the community you're serving, and we could go into examples around this, you know, you're gonna miss. And if you feel that uh, you're excluding a vast swaths of the population, because the, the country is becoming brown quickly, so why would you limit yourself to recruiting, you know, white males uh, who are soon gonna be, you know, maybe a quarter of the population? That would make no, no sense. The third ingredient is autonomy. None of us could do a survey on this Zoom. I'm gonna guess none of us like to be told what to do, right? So creating an environment where people can do what they feel is right. So we used to have scripts for uh, how to sell a TV, for example, very smart questions to ask. They were very good, but the associates hated them because they felt it was too mechanical. So we told them, we don't, you don't, use to, you don't need to use these questions. Back to my store training example or, or story or the dinosaur story or the dinosaur story. Do what you think makes sense. Use your unique genius to connect with the customer in a unique way. The fourth ingredient is create an environment where people can achieve mastery and it's all individualized. So we've deployed individualized coaching for each of the associate at scale. And we could get into that uh, discussion. And the fifth ingredient is create a growth environment where everybody feels that they, they have the opportunity to grow as individuals and as professionals. So that's the, that's the recipe, that's the philosophy. For me, this has vast implications, right? In terms of uh, how we think about business. I think for me, and, and I'll lay out a few key ideas, and then I'd be very happy to all right to open it up for debate because I know you guys are a great thinking and you care deeply about the common good and the well-being of you know, humanity. So the, the, the first idea around this philosophy about rebuilding business around purpose and humanity is to start by thinking, why do we work? What's the meaning of work? How do we think about work? Is work a curse or punishment because some dude sinned in paradise? And he was a dude, right? We know this for a fact. Um, uh, is, is work something we do so that we can do something else that's more fun? Or is work part of our humanity and part of our quest for meaning and part of our purpose in life? Clearly, I've chosen, and it is a choice how you think about work. I've chosen the latter. The second building block of the philosophy is how we think about business. So I'm very clear, I was very clear with our investors, our purpose as a company is not to make money. It's an outcome of great work, building the right team, developing some great customers and doing great things for them. It's an outcome, it's not the purpose. Same as with our purpose as human beings. I'm gonna bet that nobody, and I don't know for sure, but I, there's a good chance I win this bet if I say, no one has as the primary goal in their life to accumulate as much money as possible, right? And the same would be true from, for a company, from the standpoint of the company as a human organization, our purpose is to serve the common good, make a positive difference in the world, and use that as the North Star, put people at the center, importantly, embrace all stakeholders, and refusing trade-offs between stakeholders. So of course, the employees, the customers, the vendors, not trying to squeeze the vendors, but partnering, with the vendors for win-win um, you know, solutions, taking care of the community. Let's pause for a second. If the planet is on fire, there's no business. I think Larry Fink of the Sea of BlackRock has been increasingly adamant about this. The main risk for, for the business world is climate change. It becomes a, a real issue. Similarly, so George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis, which is where Best Buy is headquarters. So it's very close to home. Uh, if, the, if the community, if the, if the city is on fire, you cannot run a business. The Target stores, Target is also headquartered in Minneapolis. The, and the Best Buy stores closed when the city was on fire. So of course, you have to take care of the environment and the planet. Of course, you have to take care of the community. And you do it because it makes business sense to, and it, 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 it makes sense also, you know, from a moral standpoint, but it's a, a, 
it's become part of the mission. And then of course, shareholders, we do care deeply about shareholders, even though I told our shareholders that our purpose was not to make money. I also told them, look, we care deeply about you because you have a big job to do. You're, you're taking care of the retirement funds of all of us. <laughs> so we want you to do extremely well. Plus you're, you're, you know, you're a group of human beings taking care of other human beings. And they, I think they got that to Joel's point, the fact that the share price had gone up from 11 to some higher number was helpful, but they, they completely uh, got the, uh, the point. So all of this has implication about the role of business and leaders. Uh, I have a draft article for HBR that says the role of the CEO has changed dramatically in the last several years. So the mission has changed. It's no longer purely maximizing shareholder value. It's maximizing value for all of the stakeholders. The scope has changed. You know, as a CEO and as a leadership team, in the same day, you're going to need to take care about the employees, the customers, the community, the environments, the shareholders. You really have this responsibility to all of them. You need to be thoughtful about you approach that. It cannot just be gimmicks and smoke and, uh, screens and, and, and so forth. But And then the leadership model has changed as well, which is another very interesting topic. The Leadership model in the last century, I think, was very much, you know, the leader is the superhero, the born leader, uh, you know, who comes in and saves the day because he or she is the smart, usually he's the smartest person in the room and make, wants to make sure that everybody knows how smart he is. Um, and it's largely driven oftentimes by power, fame, glory, or money. So that's, let's call this 20th century. I think today we need purposeful leaders who are driven, who are clear about their purpose can connect with the purpose of the individuals working at the company who want to be a force for good, who are clear that their role is to create this environment that can unleash human magic, who are values driven and, and authentic, can be vulnerable. My most used phrase uh, you know, in my leadership roles has been, my name is Hubert and I need help. And connecting, that's the only way we can connect if we are perfect or try to be perfect, there's no way to connect as human being. Um, and uh, that's, the, that's the leadership journey, which for me has been a significant transformation because when I grew up, you know, like you, I, I was gifted a good number of good gray cells. So I thought that being smart was really how you made progress in life. Uh, but for too many years, my head was cut off from the rest of my body. And the longest journey I've had to make, as the saying goes, was the 18 inches from my head to my heart in learning to lead with all of my body parts, which I think we've seen in the last 12 months, I don't know about you guys, but we've seen so many great examples of leaders during this multifaceted crisis, leading from a place of purpose and, and humanity, putting the, their, their employees, their customers, safety and well-being first and leading from that uh, place. We've seen shareholders uh, change. Having said all of this, you know, the danger I've had is that maybe I've uh, made it sound too easy. We all know that all of this may be easy to articulate, but it's really hard to do. Part of the reason why I wrote this book is I felt that uh, there's many leaders who are on this journey, uh, but that uh, finding how to do this was the, was the challenge. And hopefully this book is going to be a good uh, guide, a playbook on, on how to, for leaders who want to lead from a place of... Uh, purpose and humanity. Why are we talking about all of this? And that's gonna be my last you know, two minutes. Um, Joel is one of the foremost authorities on philanthropy. And business has been a big source of funding philanthropy and should continue to fund philanthropy. But my hope is that beyond philanthropy, business can in of itself, in its day-to-day -day activities, be a force for good not as a substitute to philanthropy, but in its core. So if you're trying to address systemic racism, you can give money to a variety of organizations, but you can also open stores uh, in disadvantaged communities. You can also make sure that the way you score credits is not biased uh, and so on and so forth. So um, I tend to be an optimist, so forgive me for this, if that's my sin. Uh, and Joel, I hope I've not been too long. Uh, but let's have a great discussion. And Joel, back to you. 
I, the answer is you haven't been too long. I could listen to you all day. Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct, however, that it's the doing of these things that are really, that is very difficult. Um, uh, but, but, but obviously, if you don't, haven't thought about what you want to do, it's also difficult because you then wander in the desert. So you have to have some idea of what you're trying to do. But, you know, as I said to you, when I read the article that, that talked about the combination of all these things that you did, you know, I asked myself, how in the world could the people running the company not have seen some of these things? And the answer is we all get blinded by doing the same thing for too long. Um, and the truth is a, a fresh eye coming in can see these things with the way in which a jaded eye can't. Um, so I'm, I, I was struck in reading the book by how many different companies in different businesses you have been the CEO of. It, there, I, it must be somewhere around eight or 10 in the course of your, is it, it's, it's, a, it's a large number though. It's going to a handful. Yeah, more than, more than a handful. Okay. Different in, in different businesses. You know, uh, this is, I think, you know, the, you, this is, well, thought of as being pure retail, but you were also in charge of um, hotels. Um, you were in charge of travel services. Um, uh, you were, I think you had a stint at McKinsey. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, and this is off the point, but I can't help. I mean, I've, you, you probably knew Ron Daniel. Yep. Um, Ron Daniel wrote a memo um, in a, 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 a um, memoir, which he circuited to a lot of people, including me, about what McKinsey meant to him and the values. Now you look at what happened to McKinsey just this past week, where the, the, the partners who run McKinsey basically refused to renew the CEO's term for another year. How does that make you feel as a, in terms of what was wrong with McKinsey? When I knew McKinsey, when Ron Daniel was running it, it was a different organization. What happened to McKinsey? Uh, this, is a, this is out of the blue. And I know I haven't asked, didn't say I was going to think of it, but I did. So, and you may not want to answer it. So, but okay. I'm happy to answer it because we, we, we learned both from successes and some uh, failures and, and difficulties. So I spent 12 years with McKinsey. I, I was like, Joel, I was actually Ron Daniel's office neighbor in the New York office for a couple oh. of years. Uh, amazing uh, man. Uh, amazing man. Um, and I know still a lot of the people. I know Kevin Sneeder, who is the managing partner, who is not going to be reelected. I know his predecessor, uh, Dominic Barton. And I know a lot of the people there. This is a case where, so this is a challenge in any organization large decentralized, decentralized organization, there's always the risk that somebody is gonna do something wrong, something stupid. And helping Purdue Pharmaceutical sell more opioids, you know, is not only stupid, but it's evil. Uh, and it's a case where uh, McKinsey lacked, why did it happen? Probably lacked controls, because there was an environment when McKinsey was smaller, you know, two partners could decide to work for any clients uh, and take any new assignment. When I was a partner of the firm, that's what happened. I didn't ask for permission. You know, we had a lot of autonomy because it's a partnership. But at scale, you know, the the, <laughs> the main lesson for me, other than control, is the most important decision we make as leaders is who do we put in positions of leadership? So I don't want to be the, the, the one to, to throw the first stone at the partners uh, who are serving Purdue, because I don't know them. But I'm going to guess that uh, what drove them, some aspect may have something to do with greed mm -hmm. and making more money, uh, which led them to you know, pursue the next engagement, irrespective of whether it was a contribution to the common good or not, which, of course, it was not. And so the lesson for me, Joel, as a leader, so in the old days, when I was recruiting or promoting people, I would spend a lot of time focused on the expertise and the experience of the individual. So recruiting the best e-commerce or supply chain 
or finance person I could find. Over time, I spend more and more time on a different question, which is who is this individual? What drives them? What kind of leader do they want to be? I remember when I was interviewed to become the CEO of Carlson Companies, another Minneapolis based company, and many of you may know Marvin Carlson Nelson, the, the, the daughter of the founder. Uh, and I was being interviewed by her to be her successor as the first non family CEO of the company. It was on a long plane ride in 2007 between Paris and Minneapolis. We were flying plane, so eight hours. I had an eight hour interview, if you can imagine this. One of the questions he asked me is, Hubert, tell me about your soul. Who asked the question? And yet it's such a fundamental question. Yeah. Because when we recruit leaders, you know, it's this idea of leading with all of our body parts. You don't want people just to lead with their brain, their wallets. It's also the again the soul, the heart, the uh, the guts, the eyes, the ears, the hands. And so, who do you recruit, and what kind of a leader are they? What drives them? And you know, can you have trust in them? And I think that uh, you know, there's no organization that's perfect. So. You know, that fell between the cracks. But for me, the remedy, even more so than controls, and maybe you need more controls at McKinsey, is how do you promote, and essentially at McKinsey, it's promotion, right? It's internal. And it's this matrix that, when you, that you use to evaluate people in organization. One is performance, and two is leadership. And in the, you know, if performance is high and the leadership is good, it's all good, right? Right. If performance is high in leadership, attributes, ethics, integrity is not so good, what do you do? Right. I think you fire the person or you, you, know, you, you, you apply some treatment. And one of the things I, I told the officers that uh, when we're talking about leadership principles at Best Buy, I laid out it's in, in the book in the last part, right? The, my leadership expectations. One of the things I told them, look, uh, you know, a key question is, who do you serve as a leader? I told him if you're serving yourself or your boss or me as the CEO of the company, so I don't have a problem with that, zero problem, except you cannot work here. You can be promoted to being a customer of Best Buy, which is a very exciting adventure, but you cannot work at Best Buy. On the other end, you know, if you're serving the servants, meaning serving the frontliners, then we're good. And so I think that's the, that's, for me, that's the key lesson, Joel, is uh, what are our expectations of leadership and who do we promote and how do we promote leaders? Well, you were, you, uh, you were uh, in, in the other, I'm, I'm struck by when, what you learned when. Uh, in, uh, you, you went through a number of responsible CEO roles in different companies. Um, and were there particular companies where you something struck you that you saw something new for the first time that you hadn't seen before that now makes up part of what your view is? Uh, was it is was there something in each one of the jobs that you had basically that contributed to that to the the wisdom that you now obviously have and that you brought to bear and what you did at West Buy? It didn't happen instantly. And the, my and, and I read the book. It, it sound from the book. It sounds like there were many points in your career at which you learned some things that were really important that gradually fit into your basic outlook of how you run a company. Yeah, this was um, this was a journey, probably the same for each one of us on this call, right? So, my uh, journey there was a several milestone. One was a uh, dinner in the early 90s with a uh, prospective client of McKinsey. Uh, we, uh, we were hosting him for dinner, hoping to pitch him some uh, way to help him with the turnaround of the company with the CEO. And instead, we got a lecture. And that's the first time I heard this idea that the purpose of a corporation, so that was 30 years ago, is not to make money in that. Uh, in business, there's three imperatives. There's the people imperative, having the right team, properly motivated and equipped. There's the business imperative, having you know, customers that you serve with great products. And the financial imperative. And excellence on the financial imperative is the result of excellence on the people, on the 
business imperative, which itself is the uh, implication of excellence on the people imperative. And that you have to treat profit as an imperative, as an outcome, but not the goal. And he drew some implications from this. For example, he would say, when you, yeah, when you do a business meeting, performance review, don't start with financial performance. Start with people and organizational matters, then business matters, and finish with financial matters. If you do it like this, you will always have time for the financial matters because your CFO is going to make sure you do. If you start with finance, you're going to spend the entire meeting on finance. But if you believe that finance is an outcome, you're wasting your time looking at finance first. Right. Another milestone was uh, uh, writing, you're going to have a kick out of this, uh, writing uh, articles in a philosophy and theology journal about the, the philosophy and theology of work with two monks. <laughs> and that's where I discovered you know, this view of work uh, uh, being part of our uh, journey yeah. as human beings and part of our quest for meaning. Uh, there was also a painful moment, Joel, where um, one day I didn't follow the philosophy I shared, which is that um, I, I was at Vivendi Universal and applied for the, the job. This was after Vivendi acquired Universal, so in 2000. I applied for the job to be responsible for the post-merger management. And, and I had some experience in that from my McKinsey days, but the main driver for me was to get closer to the team. So it was ego. And the good news is I got punished because the job was meaningless because there was so, no synergies between the French company and, and Universal. Um, another milestone was um, after I had reached, you know, the top of my, of the first mountain, you know, I'd been a partner at McKinsey, I'd run a couple of companies and, and I felt emptiness at the top. I said, there's nothing there. And that led me to do some soul searching about what's really the, the meaning of my life, what's my calling? And so I did for two years, the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola to discern which was my vocation, my calling in life. Uh, and then, you know, at Best Buy, I learned so much from my peers, my colleagues on the executive team, but uh, from the frontliners, from store general managers who were so inspiring and living this, uh, this vision of leading from a place of, uh, of purpose and humanity. So I have stolen, borrowed, uh, plagiarized throughout my entire life. And I'm, so I'm the product of thousands of ideas and thousands of interactions. When uh, Hubert came on the board of Ralph Lauren, one of the first things that he noticed was that we didn't have an important committee, which he, he suggested being created, called the Finance Committee. Um, we didn't have a Finance Committee meeting, a Finance Committee, and we came to the conclusion very quickly that we desperately needed a Finance Committee. He saw that when he came on the board after having, you know, we made mistakes as every company does, uh, and he persuaded uh, Ralph Lauren that this was something to be done. And now, of course, Ralph Lauren is grateful for it. The rest of the board is grateful, and the stockholders are grateful because that that new look. He was he, having having suggested the creation of a finance committee. It was logic that he be named chairman of the finance committee, <laughs> and so it was. It may not have been logical to him, but it was logical to everybody else. And the consequence was, in a sense, you know, he was able to add enormous value to the Ralph Lauren Corporation because of that one step. It wasn't the only contributor to, to, to the value of the company, but it was a very important thing to have done because it enabled the company to, to make really good decisions, which without a finance committee, a company has a difficult time doing. I don't know, you may want to reflect on that. I'm not sure you can say everything you might want to say in public, but nonetheless, you know, it was a, 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 a guy with, a great deal of experience with the with the philosophy that he's articulated extremely eloquently, coming to coming to a, into a new setting, in which he basically won the day, persuaded everybody. Uh, and as I told you earlier, he is I think going to be the next lead director of the company. So um, uh, it, it is uh, all because of the combination of experience that he learned from in all of the prior jobs 
plus a good heart, which is why he calls the book The Heart of Business, because maybe the first thing that people run businesses should have is a good heart. <laughs> what do you think about that? Yeah, Joe, the, the, uh, there's a question in the chat from Alicia. We, Alicia, would you like to share your oh, question? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, thank you. Hello. <laughs> dear moderator, dear colleagues, dear participants of this impressive lecture, seminar, webinar, and I want to ask uh, my question uh, what is your main randomnicity in your professional activity thank you Alicia do you want to tell me uh, remember English is my fourth language right so what do you mean by randomnicity maybe risks in your professional activity lectures seminars and other the main risk in my professional activity I'm not sure uh, how to answer this question. Maybe the, 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 I don't know that my answer will be in direct response to your question, but I, I want to highlight that the, the journey at Best Buy, certainly in my professional life, was certainly not risk-free and certainly not uh, uh, linear. There were some tough moments. Um, and as leaders, um, how we deal with crisis and tough moments is, of course, uh, almost as uh, even more important than how we deal with when the going is easy. So in January of 2014, there was a moment where our share price went down from $39 to $27. So it had gone up from in about one year from 11 to 39, but in one day, it went down from 39 to 27. And that's because during the November, December timeframe of 2013, um, our sales had not been good. We had had five consecutive quarters of good sales, but during November, December of 2013, sales were not good. Maybe in part because the, the iPhone of that year was not great, but frankly, we had not managed the season well. And um, how did we handle this? So the day before we released our numbers, we gathered, I gathered all of the officers of the company to share the news with them. Of course, they, they knew because they were, as officers, they were managing the business, but it was good to step back. And the question I asked was, uh, tomorrow, how do we show up? You know, we have two options. One, we can show up, you know, defeated, down, uh, distressed, uh, giving uh, the opportunity to the naysayers to uh, have their day in court and say, yep, we were right, Best Buy cannot survive. Or do we show up in some other way? And I am a movie buff, so I, I asked them, so why do we fall, Bruce? And of course, that's a Batman movie. And the answer is so that we can learn to pick ourselves up. Well, there's another great movie with Al Pacino, Any Given Sunday, which is a great football uh, movie, where at halftime, Al Pacino gives this amazing inspirational speech to his team. And it turns the game around. And of course, as a team, we said, no, we're going to choose option B. And we said, of course, we're going to have to look for you know, what went wrong. And one lesson, by the way, from a leadership standpoint, when things are going well, always give credit to the frontliners. When things are not going well, always take the blame as the leader of the place, right? And so as leaders, we need to uh, have a self-inspection. What, what did we do wrong, self-included? And then decide that we're going to fix, that we're going to learn from our mistakes. And the next day, we told our investors, look, these are the results. We messed this, things up. Uh, there's a range of mistakes we believe we made. We're going to correct them, and we'll be back you know, on track. And of course, uh, they, uh, they took a while before they believed us. But, uh, and, and so as leaders, we get to choose how we, uh, how we lead in these moments. And one of my beliefs is that as leaders, we need to be thermostats as opposed to thermometers. So that, because as leaders, people look up to us to decide how to move things forward. And if we're too much of a thermometer, you know, it, it uh, sends the organization to a spin. So um, that was a uh, memorable moment 
one of the reasons why I have so many scars on my face. <laughs> Thank so, you very much. Yeah, I, I would say I don't. I'd never heard the word randomicity before, but as I remember what the like, what the meaning of that is, I don't think there is any randomicity uh, in what you've told us. My sense is that there's been cumulative learning that contributed to what your current position is, and I don't see that there's anything random about it. Other questions? Um, I was at McKinsey too for a while and have a lot of McKinsey friends, so I really respect that firm and am devastated, frankly, at its uh, precipitous fall. But my question doesn't have much to do with that. It's more about my daughter's generation, folks in their 20s and 30s seem to almost universally have a attitude that capitalism and business are bad. Very little chance you can do good and they suck your soul and everything is bad about it. And I see that with people that I respect that are smart, that are thoughtful, that care about the world. So I have two sort of questions on that. One, do you see that as a concern? Probably not at Harvard Business School, but maybe at other places. And what can we do to help move that? Because I think capitalism has proven to be a force for good when it's done well. It can be a force for horrible things when it's done poorly. So I'd love to just hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, Crawford. What, what years were you at the firm? I'm um, only four years in the 80s um, in the Cleveland office. You, you might know Brad Whitehead. You teach with Shikar Ghosh and uh, um, Jonathan Spector, maybe. He's, yep. he's Jonathan there. Spector is the name. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, it's wonderful. Fred Servi was the head of the office. I spent a day with Marvin Bauer. I'm that old. So, you know. I, uh, <laughs> I knew Marvin Bauer, of course, like the rest of us. Um, they, there is a, it's interesting to see how the predominant view of business is that uh, it's still the Milton Friedman view of business. Right. That uh, this is what business is about. It's in part driven by two things. One is uh, a number of um, corporate scandals that we're all familiar with. I don't need to list them. We're all familiar with them. And the fact that when the press talks about business, it mainly talks about business at the time of earnings. Right? If you're a company, company, this is when everybody talks about you. And by the way, they don't talk about how well you're doing. They talk about how you're doing vis-a-vis -vis expectations. So your own guidance, or more importantly, the consensus. So it's a, it's a crazy game of uh, second derivatives. <laughs> and it makes no sense. And, but the press is doing its job of reporting at the time of earnings, uh, and uh, that creates, you know, the, the noise around business. So even at HBS Crawford, part of my job is to, uh, my, part of my mission in life is to tell a different story, and, which is the story I've shared with you and, and, and with the, uh, with, in the book. The other thing I would say, there's another side to this, to this kind. So Edelman does uh, annual surveys about trust. He's got the trust uh, barometer. And today, despite what we've just said, business, people have more trust in business and in particular in their own company than probably any other institution, which may be a sad reflection on the world, <laughs> but it's true. And I think in the last 12 months, we've seen so many great examples of companies and leaders rising to the occasion and doing their piece to change the narrative. So I want to take some examples. So when Larry Fink, CEO of, CEO of BlackRock, writes to all of the company, uh, public company CEO, I think three years ago, it was about the importance of corporate purpose. This year, it's, it's all about ESG, the environment, uh, societal matters and, and governance. And State Street, the State Street CEO is doing the same. And I was on the phone with my good friend, Bill Vanguard, uh, Bill uh, McNabb, who is the former CEO of Vanguard. Uh, who's, and, and so the more, and I took, the, the first time that uh, Larry sent one of his letters, uh, I hand delivered my shareholder letter back to him. He's one of our shareholders. And I said, Larry, your letter was so good. I thought I should hand deliver my, my response, which was my shareholder letter. And I thanked him for being a voice 
on the importance of purpose and long-termism uh, you know, for, for society because it, it brings cover to boards and management team and say, you know, this is what we expect. So you can, you can no longer hide between behind, this is what shareholders want. And they say, well, you know, <laughs> let me look at what my shareholders are saying. They're saying something different. Similarly, when the business round table two years ago, uh, under the leadership of Jimmy Dimon and, and Alex Gorski, who was chairing the governance committee at the time, and then on his board now, issued the statement, the BRT statement in August 2019 on the purpose of the corporation and reestablishing this view of stakeholder capitalism that provides cover. Uh, in the following December, when I was still the chairman of the Best Buy board, we spent two hours as a board debating this. Do we believe that our primary purpose is to contribute to the common good? Do we believe that profit is an outcome? Do we believe that we are here to serve all of the stakeholders? I wanted the board and my successor as CEO, Corey Barry, to feel that we were aligned on this, in particular for my successor, to feel that she had the backing of the board to lead the company from a place of purpose and humanity. Similarly, when Marty Lipton of uh, the great firm, Wachter Lipton writes about these things and say, you know, actually the corporate law in, in the state of Delaware is such that as a board, you have immense latitude using business judgment to make decisions for the greater good. Uh, similarly, at the uh, Executive Leadership Council, which is an, an organization that uh, seeks to promote uh, racial diversity, in particular, the, the advanced uh, black leaders in companies. It was the four general counsels of four of the foremost companies in the country uh, talk about the fact that you can actually have a forceful strategy around racial diversity and being compliant with the law. You don't, if your general counsel tells you you can't discriminate you know, in a positive fashion, get a new general counsel. And uh, I'm gonna give two examples along these lines. Uh, at Best Buy, at some point I decided that, uh, you know, we need to really make progress on racial diversity. So we told the headhunter in charge of helping us recruit new board members, don't bother giving us resume of non-black directors. And uh, if you feel you are not able to find qualified black directors, it's okay. We don't have a problem with it. We'll just work with another firm. You know, it's okay. <laughs> we don't care. And guess what? They found three amazing black directors and it's been wonderful. Similarly, and I was chatting with Joel about this yesterday. On January 28, 2021, you can find this. Joel has it so you can distribute it or you can Google it. The general counsel of the Coca-Cola company, is the Coca-Cola company a great American company? He spelled out how it was a letter to the US law firm supporting the Coca-Cola company, which is probably every law firm in the US. Essentially he told them, look, if you are unable or unwilling to build diversity, racial diversity in your ranks, again, that's okay, we don't have a problem with that. We'll just lower your fees by 30% per year and then you'll be kicked out. Uh, so uh, business as power. And we have to be careful because business leaders, we're not elected officials. So we, don't, we shouldn't get confused. We are not running the country. But there are matters that are of business importance. And in particular, as I was saying, you know, if you live in Minneapolis and you see the city on fire, then it, how many gray cells does it take to conclude that you need to address the racial issues in the city? I think two little gray cells should suffice for this. And that you have to feel that you need to address this. Similarly, you know, as kids uh, are all home learning from, you know, learning from home, if kids in Minnesota don't have good broadband access and Minnesota is to a large degree a rural state, so there's a lot of broadband access issues, then you know, you're gonna have an entire generation who's gonna be lost. And you're gonna have your employees who have kids at home, you know, who are gonna be struggling with this. So Corey 
together with a number of other CEOs and the governor, they say, we need to, we're going to fix that, right? Because if not us, then who? Uh, I, one of the things I love about this country, I'm now a citizen of this country, and that's the observation that Alexis de Tocqueville made in the middle of the 19th century, is that uh, we have this capacity to not count on Washington to solve anything. In fact, we've designed Washington to limit their power, right? With the federal system and then the three branches of government. And we feel responsible. So I think this rule applies. Same with the environment. Businesses at the individual company level, as well as the sector level, can change the outcome. One of the things that Ralph Lauren Corporation is involved in, under the leadership of Paul Pullman, the, the former CEO of, uh, of Unilever, is gathered all of the major luxury and textile companies in the world across the entire supply chain. And they're working together to address systemic issues around the environment and around labor. And if you get, his view is that if you get 30 companies, major companies, and they agree on norms, then you know there's no uh, smallest common denominator. We can do the right thing. And so the key is to get involved on issues that are relevant to your business and where you're gonna not just talk, but do something. And, and I think on, on these issues that make sense, then you, you actually tackle those. And then Crawford, to, to really answer your question, that's, I think it's by, it's by doing, right? That we can change the perspective on business and that business is by, you know, the, 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 the Romans used to say, fabricando fit faber. It's by doing that you do. <laughs> so uh, I think the way, you, uh, the way you lead is by leading. Right. Quick follow-up. You didn't mention inequality of pay and wealth. Do you have any strong feelings about that or not? Shareholder ownership for all employees, et cetera. So, re could you repeat your question, Crawford? Um, question of pay inequality and then shareholder ownership for employees as a part of their compensation? Yeah, so um, pay inequality is a, I mean, social inequality in this country and around the world is a, is a big issue when, you know, we've all seen the numbers, right? It's the Average compensation at the bottom has not moved materially, whereas at the top, you know, the the level of wealth at the top is is uh, is extraordinary. And the system is fueling this, including the way CEO compensations get decided, because it's a, you know, the way it works. I'm going to spend one minute on this. Every year, the comp committee, right, Joel and I served on one together, so we won't say whether that applies to that company, but I think it's all company. The comp committee looks at numbers provided by consultants that look at what's the median for a CEO of that size company, what's the top quartile, what's the bottom quartile. Every board is gonna say, oh, we don't want our CEO to be you know, under, underpaid, right? Why, why we would want to do this? And the question is, on average you know, in the world, what's the percentage of CEOs who are paid below the median, roughly? Give me a number. Crawford is laughing. It's exactly 50% because that's the definition of the media. So at half of the companies in the US every year, they say, oh, our CEO is underpaid. We need to raise his, comp his or her compensation. And so the next year you look at it and the other half is saying, oh my God, our CEO is underpaid. So this has led this transparency, which was well-intentioned, has led to uh, annual inflation of, um, of CEO pay. So, I'm glad that companies, uh, uh, major companies are increasing minimum pay. I think uh, Walmart is there, uh, Best Buy, the minimum starting point at Best Buy is now $15. The average for the field employees is probably 17 and a half. Um, it's a hard problem to, to solve because there's risks. Uh, I've seen, you know, coming from Europe, I've seen situations where if you, it's sad, but if you increase the minimum wage too fast, then companies tend to automate, and then the lower skilled labor gets displaced from the workforce. Right. So there, there can be negative unintended consequences. So any system is difficult. Uh, widespread uh, uh, shareholding amongst the employees, it's, uh, I think it's good. It can be difficult to administer because you spread it very thin. It's not many shares. So I've seen companies try to do this and then retrench because especially if you're global, you'd 
there's so many jurisdiction, it's, it's a nightmare. And most people, you know, at the base of the pyramid, people don't care about, you know, they, at Best Buy, we eliminated, we replaced bonuses by an increase in base pay. Because if you're at the bottom, you actually need the money now to, you know, feed the children and pay the rent and so forth. So not a big fan of too much, uh, too much spreading because it's complicated. It's well-intentioned, but there's many things in life that are well-intentioned. And then you look and say, ah, not sure it actually works. But that's just, there's many things that are just opinions of the Open to the Jerry, you are a, uh, you're going to resent my calling on you, but nonetheless, uh, it, Jerry is a student in the Fuqua School of Business. Uh, you've heard what Herb, Hubert had to say. Um, how do you feel about um, his philosophy? Has it been echoed by any of the people, in the, any, any of the teachers in the, in the Fuqua School that you've had? Um, what do you, what's your reaction? Um, well, I think that a lot of, you know, I, I agree with a lot of, of a lot of the concepts and I think stakeholder capitalism is, I feel like it is the right way to think about it. I, I've heard this metaphor of, you know, humans, we make red blood cells, but that's not what we, that's not like, that's not our purpose, but we need it to survive. So that's kind of how I think it helps me think about money and business. And, um, but um, I did have a question about, you um, just, it, you know, I feel like in discussing stakeholder capitalism, it, it sounds really nice and it is, I think it is the right way to think about it, but I think it, there are some risks of it becoming sort of a PR stunt and I, I feel, or, or for companies to maybe justify their underperformance. So I just wonder if you see any risk in that and how would you address some of those risks? Yeah, the the is, you know whether it's greenwashing or, or anything like this or what companies used to do with diversity and inclusion publishing a glossy report and but there was no substance uh, behind this. I think that uh, companies that think about this uh, do this at their own peril. So I would say two things. First thing is that, and if you you know my view is that you can fool some of the people some of the time, but it's hard to fool all of the people all of the time. Employees are going to see through. If you're not real about serving the employees and the customers and the community, you know you're going to be laughed out of the room in one nanosecond. And the level of expectation, part of what's driving the movement towards stakeholder capitalism, is to change expectations of employees, customers, society, and shareholders. So beware of the temptation of fooling all of the people all of the time. Having said that. To me, stakeholder capitalism is not an excuse to underperform financially. I know a CEO who once said to uh, publicly uh, that uh, he thought that working hard for the shareholders was wrong and that they didn't deserve it. And guess what? The shareholder said, it's okay. You don't need to work for us anymore. You're gone. And uh, the for me, that's the... That's the beauty of, of my experience. But again, remember, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, um, an optimist, an eternal optimist. The way you get great economic performance over time is by focusing on the employee and the customers and the community. And um, the reason why I wrote the book is that uh, arguably the success of Best Buy, which everybody thought was going to die, gives me a credible platform to say, no, no, no. This is not in lieu of financial performance. This is, the, 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 this is not a zero sum game. I think a disease in the world is the view of zero sum game. Jerry, the only way for you to win is if I lose. Who said that? Now I know one of the things I'm struggling with at HBS is this force ranking. So I had to grade after my first semester, I had to give grades to the students and uh, I had no choice, I needed to have 10% of the students in the bottom 10%. Right. I, I struggled with that because maybe my class was all future Nobel laureates and maybe I'm the best uh, professor ever. Actually, I'm not, but just, you know, for the sake of the argument. And I'm a much, I, I, I like uh, the philosophy of Ben Zander in his book, The Art of Possibilities. Ben Zander, uh, when he teaches, tells his student, everybody's gonna get an A in my class 
only one condition. You write an essay to me in the first two weeks explaining why you're going to get the A. If you write that essay, you get the A. And uh, we in my view, it's a rule of thumb. 98% of the questions that are asked as either or are better answered as and. It makes your life so much easier. Uh, short term or long term, both. Customers or employees, both. Shareholders or other stakeholders, both. Um, and you have to, in my view, my opinion, that you have to force yourself to find win-win-win solutions. And anytime you're proposed a trade-off, you have to try to avoid it and find a better solution. It's not, it's not possible 100% of the time, I recognize this, but you have to work hard at it. That's my two cents, Jerry. And my sense, uh, Joel, is that uh, the, the view of stakeholder capitalism is much, you know, is widespread now. Most people I know embrace it. The challenge is how, right? It's all of us on a journey to figure out, and there's so much to be learned. I think we're just at the beginning of that journey. So much to be learned on how to overcome the challenges the world, the world is facing and how to make the, the world a better place and so much to learn. I think academia has a big role to play. In well, I think we're seeing in the corporate world, it's interesting, where the, the corporations who are basically right-minded about these matters um, are beginning to, to realize that they can exert their influence with their suppliers. Uh, it's very much what the example you used, you know, with Coca-Cola and the lawyers. Um, that's an extraordinary, stunning story in the sense that, they, you know, when they said to the firm, uh, they, they were talking about people at the firm, that the law firms, they were talking about um, uh, the increased number of blacks and browns um, in, in the law firm, right? Yeah, they, 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 they have the expectation that uh, they, uh, their company, their suppliers should represent the population of the country. Right. And they have the power to change that. And they want to use that power because they know morally it's the right thing to do. At the human level is the right thing to do. And then from a business standpoint, it's the right thing to do. Division in the country, the, 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 the reality of uh, racism and injustice is a poison. So we have to fix that. And so, you know, in a, the example that you gave also about shifting the burden, extending the burden, it's not really shifting the burden, it's basically using corporate power yep. to persuade your suppliers to do what the right thing is. That's the, the, the group that you talked about doing it in the world of fashion uh, is an amazing story, too, because, as you know, we've at, at Ralph Lauren, we've done a great deal of this and in, individually, individual corporations. But the notion that the fashion industry is going to say to its suppliers, you have got to do the following things. You've got to pay decent wages. You can't discriminate. All of those kinds of things. That's a wonderful way, basically, of uh, of, of, of influencing significant parts of the economy. Yep. That's exactly right. It's an amazing, uh, Ryan Comfort is sitting, he's there, and he is a small businessman in New York who start, he has a company that he started that works with on public health issues, a company, for-profit company that, 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 that provides uh, advising to foundations uh, to nonprofits and others, how does the message that Hubert has delivered um, uh, ring with you? I mean, like so deeply, and I even like was writing down certain of the language about human magic at scale, unique genius. You know, these are words that you know you expect you know from like a an Oprah inspirational book, not necessarily the CEO, former chairman of of uh, you know. A large company, but I've just been really inspired. Um, I know we're coming up on time, but I actually did have a quick, quick uh, question. Go with it. Um, great. So, and this actually ties to you and your, you know, at HBS with segmentation, targeting, and positioning. One thing that has been discussed on these FERG sessions is about um, the need for wealthy people to give more money. Um, so, Bridgespan, which spun out of Bain 
wrote a report saying that of high net worths, they give about 1.2% of their wealth um, and that they talk about wanting to do more, but they have a challenge with that. And so I was wondering if you think about target marketing different segments, how could you go to um, executives who made their wealth with um, through running companies and make the appeal more engaging for them to give more philanthropically? Well, I mean, there's the, uh, I'm not in that club, which is the, the, the billionaire club where you give 50%. I'm not in that club, but uh, <laughs> with my children, we've agreed that uh, um, I would give, I think it's, it was not a specific percentage, but it turns out to be about 70% of what uh, my net worth was going to be either wide alive or, or at the end of my, uh, of my life. And, and so this was a great conversation because my son, you know, I was giving them money over time to help them in life. And at some point, my son said, Dad, stop. You're messing up my life. Mm. Right? Because I want to make it on my own. And if you give me too much money, it's going to, it's going to be poisonous. Uh, and so I think for me, I see life as a game where uh, for some reason, I'm not a decision maker on that. You know, CEOs, we make a ton of money, uh, but there's nothing in the way of giving it away. And so it's a game of making the money, parking it. I'll admit, you know, I live well, so I use some of it. Uh, but then finding ways to give it in a, in a meaningful fashion. And, and of course, this country, and, and Joel, you've written this great book, right, about the power of the foundation and the, what, what the good things foundations have done in the, in the world. So I've not spent as much time fundraising up until now in my life, I have the feeling that in my next chapter, it's going to be a bigger part of my life. I've just joined a, a three-person committee for my alma mater in France on uh, chasing big gifts uh, uh, for HEC Paris. So I've been experienced. I've learned a great deal. I was the chairman of the uh, Minneapolis Art Institute for a short while. And so I I've learned about how to, at some point before the pandemic, we embarked on a $600 million campaign uh, and so I was learning from the consultants. Um, so in this country, there's a lot of experience. I think, but your point is, we should do more. I think we should also raise taxes, frankly. The, the tax rate you know, is just uh, crazy. I think Warren Buffett has been begging people to say, please increase my tax rate. Like, <laughs> just take his money for crying out loud. You know, he's one, he wants to give it to you. Just take it. But for some reason, it's difficult. So I don't have a good answer, Ryan, but I look forward to learning more about this and uh, how to do people's pockets in a way that makes them happy. It's, um, uh, it's a serious problem. Uh, you're right about the tax policy. I mean, the tax, uh, you know, it's, it's a vicious circle because it's the people who are employed by the wealthy and corporations that have lobbied, uh, uh, you know, for lower taxes. Republican Party is committed, basically, to always to tax cuts. And we know, and so the, gradually, you know, at one point, after this, at some point after the Second, Second World War, the maximum tax rate, in the U.S. federal tax rate, was 90%. Uh, it has is, it is now come down to somewhere in the high 30s, I think the 39% or something like that. But the truth of the matter is that, that you know, it is, it needs to be, adjusted, needs to be raised, because the truth of the matter is that we can't solve any of these problems that we're talking about without federal money. Foundations, you know, give away half a billion dollars, no, sorry, half a trillion dollars every year. But that's, the federal government spends, uh, uh, depending on how much it goes into debt, anywhere from four and a half trillion dollars a year to something like this year, more like seven trillion dollars a year. So, you know, the, the, you think about the, the comparative expenditures of foundations on education versus the federal government is really ridiculous. It's nothing. Um, so the, 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 and obviously, the, 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 because of the power of, of, the, of the lobbyists representing the wealthy at this point, it's been very difficult to get the, this, the tax policy change. But it has to happen. It may happen to some degree in this, in this Congress but it's still too early to say. But the fact of the matter is, it's a really important key. But meanwhile, we have to do what we can 
You're right about having a society based on individual choice uh, and the role as, as, in the non, of the nonprofit sector in this. It counter, it's supposed to counteract the, um, uh, the influence of government um, uh, and it does does certainly complement it, but the government has not been performing very well on any of these questions uh, for the last uh, very interesting book um, that was written by a um, scholar at Harvard uh, called, um, I used to have it over there so I could look at the title, <laughs> but in any event, the point he makes is that we're in a period, I don't want to keep you all too long, but... <laughs> We, he starts with the Gilded Age in the, in the 19th century, which lasted, according to his book, for 40 to 50 years. It was followed by a non-Gilded Age in which the government began to, to focus on the problems of, of creating all kinds of support programs for poorer people. That lasted for about another 40 years, and it's now been followed by another Gilded Age, basically, the age we're living in. Um, and, and and the truth of the matter is, you know, something has got to change because if it doesn't change, none of these problems is going to get solved. And, you know, we're going to have even more right wing um, uh, violence that, that as we have, has been it's been pointed out is a, a common thing was never common before in the history of the United States. Any event, we've gone. Uh, you bet. This is a wonderful session. You sparked great discussions. You spark great questions. You've given great answers. What could be? What could anybody ask for more? Uh, and and I, I can't thank you enough for making the time available to do this. My one hope is that we'll persuade you to come down to Duke um, uh, when, once uh, we are seeing people in person again, and then we can welcome you properly with a dinner and wine, uh, and you'll get a chance to meet more of the students and faculty members who I think resonate with what you've said and will resonate even more when they know you've said it. And, and so I'm spreading the word about your book. And when, once it comes out and I can buy copies, I'm going to spread it around among my friends. So in any event, I can't thank you enough. And I hope, that, uh, hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have, except for the glitch technologically at the beginning. <laughs> um, in any event, thank you. And thank all of you all for attending uh and i look forward we have another ferg coming up um uh, can you help me iman imani when is the next one our next ferg is um march 24th it's rip rapson and then on april 7th we have adam falk the president of the sloan foundation yes um rip rapson uh is those of you who's heard rip before uh, it's, he's an amazing guy, runs the, um, the um, uh, I want to say the Serdna Foundation, the Kresge Foundation. Uh, and it is, he's been the president there through all of what's been done in, in uh, first in Minneapolis and then in Detroit. Uh, and so he's coming back again. He comes down at my invitation every two years to fill us in on what is happening in Detroit, which is a major center of poverty and also innovation and it and also really interesting stuff going on so i encourage you to come back for these future fat fergs and we'll we'll we will present if he's willing to do it hubert for an in-person one where we can really go to town and entertain him properly so thank you all for coming and uh thank you especially hubert a, a great pleasure to have you here thank you thank you all